Good evening, everybody. I'm um, Philip Plowright, Associate Professor at the College, and I have the great distinction of introducing our guests this evening. Um, I do have one administrative announcement, which has to do with there is a sign-up sheet for AIA credits if anybody's doing continuing education, just outside the door. Good, done. Um, tonight, we're completely blessed to be um, joined by Design with Stuart Hicks and Alison Neumeyer, who I predict in five years will not speak to us because the trajectory they're on is seriously upwards. Um, I've known Stuart for quite a while, Alison for um, a bit less, but in the last couple of years, the, the vision, the output, and the quality of work is just phenomenal. And I'll introduce a couple of things to, to give evidence of this. Most of the work, and I have to say, Design With is an incredibly focused um, design practice, which is very much interested in the relationship between t design and narrative, the spectacular, the mythical, and the real. So there's, there's both um, a sense of pragmatism, but also a sense of, of whimsy and wonder to the work that they do. And it, it comes through, um, through all of their projects. There's an in incredible body of work that they're starting to produce. Um, and some of these projects, which I hope that we see tonight, uh, Farmland World, Monument to Bruce, and the Arkazines, Ziggurats, and Zinnery, um, which were done you know, 2010, 2011, 2013. In the last year, two, just one year, 2015, um, they've exhibited at the Chicago Benali, and more than that, because you know the Chicago Benali is actually putting a lot of projects up. They were one of four offices picked out by the New York Times to actually represent everything that the Benali was trying to do, uh, which is a huge, both uh, an accolade and an accomplishment. Um, they published the book *Misguided Tactics of Proprietary Collaboration*. A calibration through the Graham Foundation. They exhibited a show, a Treatise of Why, um, Why You Write Alone. They won the Ragsdale Ring competition. They were a resident of the Ragsdale Artist Colony, and they constructed Shawtown, which was a contemporary outdoor theater. Um, they won a second competition, the Robson, uh, the Robson Redux competition in Vancouver, which was a major architectural piece. Um, they were featured as the next progressives in architecture magazine, and Stuart was awarded the High Chair of Excellence by the University of Nebraska. That's one year, okay? Five years from now, <laughs> and, we, and so I do, I feel, I feel completely blessed to, to introduce two people that I hope you get to know better, uh, and I'm continuing to watch with great excitement. Um, Stuart and Allison. Wow, Philip, thank you for that excellent, wonderful introduction. I hope our talk lives up to that. Um, I, I, we also want to just start by saying thank you to Lawrence Tech um, f and Philip uh, for the support that you guys have uh, showed us over the years. I, I taught I taught a class here in 2006, my very first course. <laughs> Um, and have kept touch with the, the school and Philip over the years. Last two years ago, we maybe we should stand apart. Two years ago, we uh, it? taught here in the summer. <laughs> <laughs> we like to keep our, our distance, and uh, it's just been an incredible ride. And <laughs> yes. Can I turn it down? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so uh, today, uh, if, if it's not clear just by looking, I'm Stuart Hicks. I'm Allison. Um, and uh, we're excited to talk about some ideas that underpin our work uh, and excite us. And uh, we want to do that by telling some stories, show some of our favorite buildings, uh, and talk about what it might mean for architecture to learn from the Midwest. And our work deals with the collision between the disciplines of uh, literature and architecture. And as such, we find ourselves agreeing with people like Victor Hugo, who believed that architecture and literature sprung from the same cultural impulse. And so what he believed was that uh, buildings were basically stories made out of stone, that um, stories were being passed down orally for generations, but they would change, get lost, and cultures needed a way to more permanently and more clearly uh, speak to uh, future generations. And so 
he argued that architecture was the means to do that as a kind of um, petrification of stories into space. And so we, we find ourselves agreeing with um, people like him. And with literature as a kind of foundation for the way that we thinking about, think about architecture, we necessarily get into, into other territory, into territories like narrative, um, typology and type, uh, fiction, symbolism, satire, et cetera. And in the broadest sense, the alignment uh, makes it, between literature and architecture makes its way into our work as stories that become the context for an architectural project. Uh, the story allows us to kind of fictionalize the world, um, and it becomes the kind of reason for an architectural design to exist. Uh, in that way, the project can be read not just as a correct answer to a problem, or the right answer, or to even solve problems necessarily, but instead to seek mutually incompatible alternatives. So either way, it gives us the opportunity to approach problems laterally. Um, rather than thinking about what should happen, we like to think about what could happen. Um, to produce projects that might be funny, beautiful, tragic, um, satirical, all at the same time. Um, so in this project, we envisioned an alternative use for a hole in the ground, which was dug for a building that was never built. Um, and with the project, we told the story of an institution centered around the hole, not as a, as using the hole as a mold for pressing patties of land for Chicago to stretch to new horizons. Or when asked to imagine a new use for a convention center, we thought it'd be a good idea to utilize its roof as a place for scale replica of the city of Chicago. We covered it with a simulator mound and subjected it, the model and the visitors to various disaster scenarios like floods, fires, earthquakes, uh, meteor attacks. Um, it was both a spectacle for viewing as well as a planning tool. Um, or when we were asked to imagine an afterlife for the building on the left, which was facing demolition. Um, others were proposing something kind of like the image on the right, skyscrapers that would sit on top to make the building useful again. And we realized that its destruction was a foregone conclusion. So our contribution wasn't to mourn its death or loss, but celebrate its removal and design a monument for the wrecking ball that took it down. The role of the project is to provide people, to pro provoke people um, to think differently about preservation. And by using the tools of an architect like renderings and drawings, um, make proposals that construct a narrative. And so we constructed that narrative around it, and I'll kind of read um, the story of the monument. The formation of the building is fraught with tension between the city, the material reality of architecture, and public events. The last design for expansion had failed. They called it Muffin Top, M-U-F-F-I-N-T-O-P, which stands for moving up from figural icons now to overcome the prentice. The concrete shell proved too confining. So that's kind of like the previous image we just showed that a lot of the proposals were. Not to throw stones at anything. Yeah. <laughs> Gina Gang. Oh, whoa. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the high strength concrete of the Prentice building requir required a special steel alloy wrecking ball to withstand the force of the repeated blows. An extraordinary ball was forged. The inscription reads, Pre proceed through concrete obstacles for health and prosperity in Chicago. A case was constructed to protect and display the ball on its journey between the steel mill and its ultimate battlefield. People affectionately called the ball Bruce. The ball lumbered through the Chicago grid during its parade march. It was so heavy that the float could only turn left in loops. People chanted Bruce, but it sounded like boo. A celebration marked the first hoisting of the ball. It was destined to become one of the Chicago's greatest landmarks. This is the timber frame podium, welcomes the occasional visitor and houses the archive for documents related to the controversy of the destruction. In this project, the connection is fundamental to the conception of the project, um, the con to literature. Um, we invented a narrative as a context within which the project lives. Uh, the project can be understood in multiple ways. It's simultaneously funny and tragic and beautiful. 
But the alignment between architecture and literature goes deeper than that for us. And we want to talk today about the concept of character as it pertains to architecture. And maybe we could kind of all go through the uh, exercise of thinking about the last time that you used the word character to describe a building or a space. And it probably sounds a little like, oh, I like this apartment because it has character. Um, and what you probably meant by something like that was that it uh, was unique, um, that it had probably elements that looked uh, like they were old, and the apartment or space had its own personality. Uh, but you probably didn't use a word like that in a context of an architecture school. Um, and that's because at first glance, it seems like as a concept, maybe it's not so useful because it seems kind of vague. Uh, and it, it's difficult to use as a kind of concept for uh, a kind of design pr pr proposition. But that wasn't always the case. Um, and the concept of character has a really long history in architecture that kind of takes us to uh, 18th century France, uh, where a group of architects uh, were all working on a common goal of thinking about what character might mean for buildings and for architecture. And people like Quadimir de Quincy, uh, was, who was a theorist of architecture, categorized this type of work into three different types. And for Quadimir de Quincy, character wasn't simply a set of idiosyncratic acts or a way of being um, uh, quirky. Um, instead, it was how the emotional proclivities of a nation are manifested in its built works. And so these three types are essential, distinctive, and relative. And he uses three different architects to uh, talk about these three different types. Essential is what we mean when something has character. And so when we, the, these terms can also be used for people as well as buildings. So when we say someone or something has character, uh, in the case of a person, we mean that they have a kind of strong moral compass. If that person has character, they're not going to um, you know, do a drug deal or something. Or maybe if they do, they like, live up to what they say they're going to do. Um, <laughs> And in architecture, uh, the essential character for Claudemir de Quincey was about uh, its massiveness. Uh, it was something big, bold, that uh, had a very simple kind of silhouette. And uses uh, Boulet as an example of someone who uh, exhibited in his work essential character. He also talked about distinctive character, which is what we mean when we say that something has a character. And what he meant by that was when somebody had like a scar on their face or they looked pr uh, a particular way because of their ethnicity or something that um, the way that something looks based on particular uh, sort of environmental changes to them is what gives them their uh, distinctive character. And so this was also true for architecture. So the distinctive characteristics for architecture was based on things that changed it and, a, and a, a, a kind of were in play because of its context in the world. And third is relative character, which is what we mean when we say something has its own character. And this is basically what we mean when something uh, looks like what it does. So when a factory has factory character. And he uses uh, examples to, uh, to talk about all these three um, conditions. But we want to call attention uh, to the middle set, um, which in the last slide was used the, used the work of Jean-Jacques Lequeux as a means to describe distinctive character. Uh, so we want to look a little bit more closely at him as a way of kind of diving a little bit deeper into this concept. Uh, Lequeux is kind of crazy, um, as evidenced by these um, slides of, uh, that show drawings that he made of himself. Uh, he would design uh, speculative buildings, um, but he would also uh, draw himself dressed up as characters uh, with different costumes, and he would make different faces, different facial expressions, and things like that, and try to record how his face transformed from one expression to another. So Lequeux wasn't necessarily interested in like, the static geometry of a kind of classical beauty that we would understand of people uh, drawing faces. Instead, he was interested in these kind of contortions and the expression that a face can offer. And he had translated this into architecture. But what we want to offer is a, some, a little bit of a slightly different way of looking at these, not the same as um, Claudemir de Quincey, but to talk about him as someone who is in character, uh, which has a double meaning for us. If something is in character, that means it's playing a role. Uh, there is a real person that is playing a part in a fiction as a fictional entity. Uh, but also, on the flip side of that, if something is in character with something, it means that it's in line with our expectations for it. Um, so if something is in character with its surroundings, that means it fits in, uh, and it is uh, something that um, uh, is, is what we'd expect out of, uh, out of a certain situation. So this idea of being in character, I think, is what we want to try to contribute to this conversation about character and um, add a little bit more depth to that as a kind of architectural concept. Um, so we started diving a little bit deeper into some of Lequeux's work, um, and we couldn't help but notice a similarity between some of the buildings that we were finding in the Midwest. 
Um, so to kind of maybe explain his a little bit, he uses fragments that are sampled, scaled, rotated, flattened, and recomposed. Uh, for instance, uh, on the building on the left, uh, the porticos on the top of the columns and the pediments don't go all the way across, which creates a misalignment of the symmetry. And it looks to us an awful lot like the Mars Cheese Castle, which is an hour north of Chicago in Wisconsin, where cheese is so important that they build a castle for its display. Um, and curiously, there are similar design tactics used. Um, LeCue's buildings took on the appearance of things from outside the domain of architecture, which remained legible in elevation. Um, he searched for an idiosyncrasy by a wonderful mixture of transformed everyday features, theatrical fantasies, and symbolism, like buildings that look like cows. Um, and then in Salem, North Dakota, you can find uh, Salem Sioux, which is the world's largest cow. So the overlaps between LeCue's work and the Midwestern constructions are a little uncanny, um, like we're living in a kind of realized dream. And Stuart and I want to live in these fantasy worlds. So both of LeCue's and the Midwestern constructions have a fantastical mix of older heterogeneous elements and willful collages of styled parts and formal quotations that come together with visible themes between them. So we thought to ourselves that the Midwest might be a good case study to understand character and architecture because there's too much space with too few characteristics. Um, therefore, it deploys architecture to produce new narratives and identities for places and collections of people. So we embarked on a project to learn from the Midwest um, and to look at some of the found conditions that we uh, see here. And to learn how and to figure out how architecture might behave in new and unexpected ways by thinking about how that found condition could be incorporated into the discipline of architecture. And so we are trying to translate this or try to figure out how this fits in the discipline. When we look west and we learn from places like Las Vegas um, and Robert Venturi, we find lessons for architectural communication and science and their role in creating space and, and uh, allowing buildings to communicate with people. When we look east and learn it from places like a Delirious New York, we find lessons about collectivity and program. So naturally, between those, we find evidence for how they might come together, uh, where architectural communication and figuration are, uh, can produce new collective identities. And so we want to spend a minute to discuss our favorite. It's the world's only corn palace in Mitchell, South Dakota, USA. So I just want you to soak it in for a minute, <laughs> how beautiful this thing is. Uh, and at first take, we understand that it, might, it probably looks a little bit strange. Um, it's decorated with onion domes, it has minarets, uh, it has flags and murals. The building was designed in 1921 by the Chicago architects Rapp and Rapp. Uh, and Rapp and Rapp are, are mostly famous for all of the um, theaters that they've done across the United States. So one of their famous ones is the Chicago Theater. And so we think it's important to kind of um, identify and, and understand that this building was produced by an architect that is well known for producing theaters, kind of connecting it back to this idea of character and literature and architecture. Performance. And performance. USA Today de declared that this building of theirs was one of the top 10 places in America to play high school basketball. Uh, but that's only one of the reasons why we think it's our favorite building. Its purpose was to write a new narrative for the town of Mitchell through architecture. And it did this by showcasing the fertility of the soil and encouraging people to settle on it. The people of Mitchell look to architecture as a means to reframe an aspect of their everyday life, in this case, the ground, and celebrate it as a means to produce an identity for a territory where there was no identity previously. The building performs by serving as a canvas for a series of mosaics made from ears of corn. Every year, the mosaics are reassembled according to a theme and are composed from 12 strains of different of corn types, each that has a unique color. It takes about 50 acres of land to produce the necessary corn for one year's worth of corn murals. And in this way, there's a kind of deep dependency between the surface of the building and the surface of the ground uh, upon which Mitchell sits. And we like to think of the building as a kind of projection of the ground, as a kind of concentrated and recomposed version of the horizontal uh, put into the vertical. At the conclusion of the corn mural dec uh, decoration every year, there was an event called the Corn Palace Festival that takes over the entire town of Mitchell with concerts, 
carnival rides and food vendors. So here's a building that gives identity to a collection of people by celebrating and reframing an aspect of everyday life. Its impact is many times greater than its physical footprint, and it has its own festival. Uh, the building is a performance, and we think that this is incredible. Uh, it's a dream on display that others can rally around, despite the fact that everyone can see behind the curtain. We might think of the building maybe in, in literature, not thinking of buildings as a text, but instead as a performance. And buildings can fold their audience into the narrative. They can allow people to become part of the performance in an architecture that celebrates the everyday while producing alternatives to it, where buildings and people can all get into character by putting on corn hats. <laughs> and so our book, uh, Misguided Tactics for Propriety Calibration, is a record of these discoveries. Uh, but we couldn't just uh, make a catalog of them because, you know, we like to tell stories. So what we did was we would pretend that these types of Midwestern constructions followed some sort of rule book or guidebook that no one else had access to except for everyone in the Midwest. Uh, and they're finally making it available to everyone else. Uh, and so in this mythical guidebook, uh, inside of our book, there is a retroactive set of design standards for Midwestern architecture. But the punchline is that we never actually show you what's inside of this book. Uh, instead, we focus on the evidence for the existence of this book and the drama that led to its necessity. <coughs> the format follows LeCue's fragmentary architectural logic uh, into a form of literature called collage fiction, which pairs collages with short bits of texts. We are always interested in the loose fit between image and text. In this case, we explore the potential of a tonal counterpoint between the narrative that accompanied uh, the image. And so we want to tell a little bit of that story now. Okay, the story begins. The eventual publication of Midwestern Standards for Propriety Calibration has its humble beginnings in the combination of three independent institutions. From top to bottom, they are the Midwestern Casting Agency, the Institute for Reduction and Enlargement, and the Redundancy Assurance Company Co. Each institution was devoted to tallying and standardizing the Midwest through the precise measurement of its geography. They used the latest techniques. And they loved the grid. The Midwestern Casting Agency drew and redrew the boundaries in the Midwest, but no one could decide on the best shape. The Institute for Reduction and Enlargement measured deviations within one square mile. Squares. The Redundancy Assurance Company Co counted and classified the squares trapped within the web of the Jeffersonian grid. The three institutions initially didn't think to communicate with one another, and thusly, the definition of the Midwest was in constant flux. Determining the most appropriate definition of the territory was the topic of conversation at the most lavish parties. Emotions were mixed among natives over the confusion and the constitution of their homeland. In order to find a solution, the three institutions eventually united to create a full-scale standard square mile they called the culture. This one mile area square contains everything it means to be in the Midwest. It is a one-to-one -one scale sampler of Midwestern geography and settlement patterns. The model of this territory was supposed to be on view as part of an exhibition here. Unfortunately, <laughs> that didn't work out. Um, however, uh, if, if it was here, uh, what you would have seen uh, is an average of an average, an average mile of everywhere in USA. Uh, so the composition of the squares is a kind of sample uh, of different types of settlement patterns all over the Midwest, where we have farming, uh, uh, the city, um, uh, suburbs, all in the correct proportion of how they exist in the Midwest. But reframing this thing in its, in its sampled parts makes it look anything but average. And instead, it looks more like a fairy tale land. And it is also the home to the newly combined institutes, which form the conglomerate called the Institute for Quantity, Scale, and Image. And this uh, territory we thought of as a kind of testing ground for Midwestern architecture and its propriety. Uh, so it would be a way of kind of testing whether a monument or a kind of Midwestern institution could reframe the way that we thought about the, the territory. So we kind of mixed up different buildings and uh, the, 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 the kind of found institutions based on their um, symbolism, narrative, and metaphor. So like the, the buildings known as the corn cobs in uh, uh, Chicago are put amongst a cornfield. Uh, in the upper left, you can see a model of one of our projects. Um, so let's look a little bit closer. It looks like a big turnip. 
or a little white turf, I guess. <laughs> but it's not. <laughs> it's a chain of agro-tourist resorts sprinkled across the American countryside. Farmland World is part theme park and part working farm and has capitalized on both recent investments in high-speed rail infrastructure and plentiful farming <coughs> subsidies. This network of resorts combines crowdsourced farm labor with ecotainment. The resort is patrolled by a series of farm implements that complete traditional farm tasks in combination with providing grand rural techno spectacles. They're called animal farmatures. There's, there's actually a, something hanging in your lobby with the <laughs> farmatures. <laughs> Check it out after. Yeah. Initially, the iron horse locomotive captured the imagination of Americans as a human machine animal hybrid. It subjugated the pastoral landscape to the ingenuity of human invention. In addition to conquering space and time, the train was a new viewing mechanism that transformed the environment into a moving picture show through isolation, speed, and frame. But now we've come full circle. And here, the, you can see the cow combine and its native habitat as it's seen for passing in the passing high-speed train. Um, it's providing entertainment during the kind of long ride through the middle. So the pink one in the front is showing excitement by spewing corn, and the green one is giving a little wave. Um, so to maybe look a little closer at the cow combine farmature, um, the parts of the cow will articulate to both work the land and entertain the high-speed rail riders. Um, so it's always about performance and um, performance. Pro <laughs> productivity. Performance. Um, so for instance, the bladder will, holds the irrigation, um, the head and ears articulate to bow and harvest corn, and the backside is where the exhaust occurs. <laughs> so going back to creating spectacles from the everyday, we believe that the animal farmatures uh, would be at home at events like Porcapalooza or agri agricultural expos. Um, at these events, pigs are put on display and their culinary possibilities explored. Um, at the expos, the machinery created to cultivate the land has a cult following. So objects that are typically valued for their efficiency and production value are objectified and lusted over. Um, so in the, this is a section of Farmland World, um, and it's a vast amphitheater that overlooks a staged farm-related events. Um, the gassy turnip is composed of too many farmhouses. Each one is unique, but part of a family. It's a farmhouse bulb hotel. Um, the pasture arena and the center space creates uh, places where you would have events that you might have seen at the, those agricultural expos or Porcapalooza. Uh, but here, participants can experience the similarities between animals and machines. Um, what's your part? <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't like this joke. And if you look up at the scoreboard, you can notice one of today's activities. It's uh, Roger Federer, the Swiss tennis player, getting intimate with a cow. <laughs> You're welcome. Back to the architecture. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so the organization of the plan uh, creates adjacencies between visitors, machines, and animals. It's a little hard to see, I guess. Um, so there's a central kind of pasture arena where those Roger Federer would have been before. Um, it's arranged by eight kind of main spokes that serve as docking stations for the flock of animal farmatures. Um, in addition to the cow combine, we also had a pig plow, um, a sheep baler, um, a horse manure spreader. Um, so the docking station, it has a connection to the arena also to give the farmatures a view of the show. Um, the spokes work to organize the residual space between them, so it creates a correspondence or a conversation where humans partake in the amenities served by that dock. So the horse, the, or the cow combine docking station serves on one side, an ice cream parlor, and on the other side, a steakhouse. Um, and then sitting within the poche between those two things, the web and the spokes, um, are the slaughterhouses, kitchens, and real animal counterparts peeking out to see their robotic mirrored self, such as like this, for instance. Um, guests have the opportunity to get close to the real animals and their robotic counterparts. You can pet them, you can become friends with them, you can pick out your favorite based on either juiciness or anticipation of writing one. 
So the robot robotic performers extend the tradition of machines using and mimic mimicking animals while creating a majestic reconstructed terrain of roaming beasts. So in the past year, we've been uh, fortunate enough to try to translate these kind of sensibilities and speculative projects into a series of built proposals, um, that some of which Philip listed uh, before. And um, so we've been concentrating in, in, in thinking about buildings as performances um, that are activated by people. Uh, and so this is uh, one of the first ones, uh, a pavilion that we built this summer, early this summer. Um, it was a temporary theater at an artist colony called Ragdale, which is just north of Chicago. And we stayed there for about six weeks. It was supposed to only be four, but uh, we... Took too long. Yeah, it took too long. <laughs> uh, and we were able to stay there with nine of our friends to help build it. Uh, the project consists of two primary components. Um, the stage, uh, which we're thinking of as a kind of wooden toy box, and the seating, which is in the form of these large cushions. Uh, each is a study in, uh, well, so the architect of this Ragdale place was named Howard Van Doren Shaw, and he was actually a pretty prolific architect in Chicago, and uh, the, this colony really uh, values this history uh, and their kind of legacy going back to Van Doren Shaw. And so our idea was to take and sample elements of his architecture and frame them out, make them a little bit smaller, and then make them soft uh, as a series of these cushions where people could sit. So people can uh, use them in different ways. They're not necessarily this, the shape of a sofa, but they're about the size of a sofa. So people can kind of find how they want to use them best, uh, and they can interact with architecture maybe without even knowing it. And so we wanted to uh, show this project primarily through a video, which we made while we were there. Stop, stop. I knocked it over. It was the shawl. Take two. It was the shawl. It's the shawl. She's wearing a shawl. The shawl shawl. What part of me is in this? I'm good now. How are you feeling? You feeling good? You ready for this? Sure. I'm ready for some questions. All right. Just don't make it up already. <laughs> Let me know if you feel uncomfortable. We're in a safe space. Ragged. Right <laughs> My favorite part of the Shawtown project is uh, again, the pillows. Um, I just like how playful they are. Um, and I think that, like, when we're finished and we have the gal, I think everyone will really just have a lot of fun with the whole thing. What's your favorite part of the Shawtown project? I mean, I, I personally tend to enjoy the construction. Uh, what's your favorite part of the Shawtown project? Favorite part? I think just the, the story with the, the kind of main zigzag roof truss that was a good one. Uh, it's 400 pounds. We had to rent the genie lift and pretty much maxed it out. We had to engineer a two-by scrap box to hold in the place. It's kind of a big event. 
wheeling it out, bringing it in, and had everyone kind of on board to raise it up. I think it was a pretty tense moment, but I also haven't really been outside in a couple of years <laughs> since starting grad school, so I think I think that's good for me also. What's been one of your most memorable experiences while staying here? Uh, the, the evenings and generally have always been still kind of stick with me. It is like a fantasy land, right? There's like someone who cooks for you. What uh, is your favorite meal by Linda? Lasagna. The lasagna was awesome. The ravioli lasagna. At the same time we were doing, that was, I mean, watching the video, I think that also shows like how much fun we had while we were there. Um, so it was a really good experience and it's a competition they run every year. So I would encourage everybody to look into it. Um, but while we were there um, working very hard, uh, we were also producing this project, um, which is in Vancouver and it's called Porch Parade. Um, it also uses fragments of architectural components collected around a theme. In the case of this, in this case, the theme was connection, as set by the competition brief. So porches are a liminal space connecting inside to outside, connecting people to the community. Um, it's also an introduction, and Porch Parade ends up being all inter introductions. Um, the main course is kind of left up to your imagination. Uh, but what you do get is an object that's ripe with potential to bring people together in new and exciting ways. Um, the porch is an object that prompts various associations with different people who visit the parade. Um, it's been Im important at various times um, for different reasons. So for instance, before air conditioning, um, it was a necessity as another room. Um, during modernism, it was associated with fresh air and healthfulness. Um, in the Victorian era, it was a separation from the backyard, which was filled with smelly things. Um, in Japan, it's called the Ingawa, which is a specific overhang that both creates an outdoor corridor, but it frames the landscape from above and brings the nature into the house. Um, British porches were a place of worship, and, and in Southern American states, it's a symbol of power and also racial tension. Um, so if you come to the porch parade, um, your function might be one of those, but it could be something that you make up for your, yourself. Um, so it's a collection of parts that is recognizable but unfamiliar through repetition and new context. Um, so these are stills from the sit sitcom Scrubs. I don't know if anybody watches that anymore. Um, but in this episode, the main protagonist, JD, buys a piece of land and he can't afford a house. So his idea is to build just a porch. Um, the porch allows him to enjoy the land in, in a way that he couldn't without it. Um, he can gather with friends, enjoy a protected outdoor setting, be neighborly, um, and none of these could be done with just a lot. Uh, so porches are the thing that visually connotes the function of a domestic building. Um, and in this way, it's a visual spatial introduction, a room between the inside and the outside. And this idea of betweenness saturates the porch between public and private, between the house and the garden, between community and neighbors. So if the porch is the theme of connection, we also want to look at the city of Vancouver for inspiration um, from the place. So one of our heroes, James Wines, um, who is of site architecture, um, constructed this installation as part of the 1986 World Exposition in Vancouver and it was called Highway 86 Processional. Um, so transportation and communication were the themes of that expo. Um, and James Wines puts objects for transportation in a frozen parade. Um, they're all removed from their context and painted white, which allows them to interact in unexpected ways. 
So if we're trying to trace a kind of architectural lineage of this kind of performance that we're gunning for, we might look to people like John Haydick and his wall house uh, to produce the kinds of displays and activities, uh, collectivities that we're thinking of. So in this example, or in this project, the house is bisected by a wall. And in each of the primary rooms of the house, is, uh, it's thought of as its own world. It has its own color and shape. And it's put on display with the concrete wall as a backdrop. So the building becomes a kind of three-dimensional painting where the spaces of the home are separated and put on display. And that's kind of how we were thinking of his porch parade as well. So porch parade is bisected by a wall. In this case, it has a series of pitches uh, cut into it. But then porches are stuck onto either side. And so what you get is a fairly complex spatiality uh, between the two sides. Um, working together to create uh, this kind of collection of porches. Each, is, each porch is unique. Uh, each one is at a different height, and so it creates a kind of up and down and back and forth uh, between and kind of passing back. This kind of passage uh, between the wall for like, people like Haydick was, um, was hugely important. So he talked about the wall as a kind of architectural event. Uh, Venturi also talked about the wall as an architectural event, and that's kind of how we're thinking about it as well. Um, so the the color in the everybody always asks us why is it gradient um, or rainbow, and so the color we were thinking would allow the porch parade to be treated as a single object. Um, so it challenges the part to whole relationship of the porches. Um, it could be one thing, it could be many things, but you never really kind of look at it and first see an individual porch because the gradient happens in the middle. Um, that was also another challenge on the project, um, was getting that blended color. Uh, we worked with a scene shop that does theater sets, and they were actually able to do the kind of blending um, off-site and bring it to the project. One important contribution to it was also our collaborator, collaborator on it, Arab Engineers, who donated their time and expertise to it. Um, so we talked to them in April. Um, and worked closely with them to make sure that the build that this thing wouldn't fall over in a wind gust. Um, they they kind of thought it was a big giant sail. <laughs> we had to explain no, it's porches, um, because of the way that this big tall uh, thing where we couldn't drill into the street, we couldn't hold it down with anything. So the way that they thought of um, these porches were as a series of uh, enclosed rings. So uh, each ring goes from the post up into the ceiling, down through the wall, and down uh, into either a concrete, or into a uh, planter, or into the porch itself. And so these rings uh, were all weighted down with uh, a total of 20,000 pounds of concrete. And uh, they were able to keep it from um, tipping over, although it made it hard to take apart after. Um, but uh, we were thinking about this thing as a kind of modular system, and it was, actually. Um, because it needed to be uh, produced off-site um, in the scene shop and then hauled to the site and put up together in less than a week. And um, we also donated all the materials um, to Habitat for Humanity to build new porches out of the project. So it has a kind of afterlife to it. And so the project, um, it, I mean, it's, it's born from this kind of conceptual idea of this collection of porches, but it has a complex spatial uh, relationship to itself as well as to the city. So the thing could be understood as a stage, um, and it was a stage for quite a while. People would play music on it, and people would get onto it, and the, the, the porch itself becomes like a stage. It's also a kind of device for reframing and viewing the city. So you look through the, um, the openings, sometimes you see another porch, sometimes you see people sitting on the porch, sometimes you see the city, uh, and it, it makes this kind of layering effect of, of framed views between people in the city. Um, we were really excited about um, seeing people kind of interact with it once it was open. Um, so here there's a gentleman who's dressed actually in the same colors as the porch parade, um, taking a photo. So he's using it as a backdrop um, for this woman, but right next to her there's also a kid that's kind of climbing all over it. Um, Ruining his photos. Yeah. Um, but it was, f it was really interesting to get a, a chance to see people interacting with it in different ways that we didn't expect. Um, we've been kind of following it on Instagram all summer, so that's also a lot of fun. And again, just kind of looking at the way that the, the project uh, creates framed views within itself, but also to the city. So there's a, 
what is it, falafel cart there on the right that's pink. Uh, it's the same color pink as the, the, the building. Um, and the way that uh, it allows you to kind of peek around the corner and see people that are using it sitting on a rocking chair. And so we decorate, we uh, uh, brought in a whole bunch of porch furniture to, to kind of be able to use these things as, as porches. Um, or another image on the right there where um, the thing kind of frames the people that are taking a picture such that it almost looks like a picture on a wall. Um, and so these, you know, to be honest, were not the things that we were thinking about. We were thinking about it framing people, but we didn't really think about that kind of depth that it would start to pull into it. So we thought, we were pretty amazed by the way that it kind of sucked the city into it at the same time as it's, um, as it's a kind of object that seems really out of context. And so I think a lot of our work tries to play that game where at first maybe it seems out of context, but it's really all about context. And it's really all about kind of uh, operating on the myths and the narratives and the stories that underpin the way that we think about places um, where we live uh, in our everyday. And so some other ancestors for the project might look like this, the Piazza d'Italia by Charles Moore, um, a project that people love to hate. <laughs> um, <laughs> Charles Moore also believed that buildings were a performance. Um, and in this case, he thought of the, uh, this project as a collection of colonnades. And these colonnades, colonnades is a kind of fancy word for porch, but uh, colonnades are, are, were brought together from different time periods. They reference uh, place things from all over the world, and they're brought together in a kind of collection here, and uh, each one is allowed to have its own personality. It kind of has its own context, its own history, its own story, and its own set of references. And the project collides these worlds together, um, and people could know where they come from, or they might not know where they come from. Sometimes that matters, sometimes it doesn't. So some people might be frustrated with the fact that they don't know why this looks like it does, but other people might make up their own stories as to why there's this kind of collage of things and fragments from all over the world. And so this, this misuse of context, this misuse of scale, uh, produces a series of elements that are recognizable, um, but, but are made unfamiliar through the, the new context and um, adjacencies. And so we wanted to leave you with our project for the uh, Chicago Biennial. Um, they call it Biennial versus Biennale. I don't know why, but it's, it's less important. Yeah, it's American. <laughs> um, and so our contribution to the Biennial is a project that we call Late Entry to the Chicago Public Library Competition. The original competition was a, uh, was a 1987 developer-led competition uh, to create a new home for the public library after it had left the building that is actually now housing the biennial. So it's called the Cultural Center. It used to be the library. Uh, and so now this project kind of sits in that building, which was important to us. As some of you might know who's been to Chicago, uh, that competition yielded this building. Um, it's called the Harold Washington Library. And it was completed in 1989. And it was a controversial choice um, for a number of different reasons, um, which include its use of history, so the fact that it looks old and it borrows elements of older architecture, uh, also the way that it deals with the city and public space, so it's actually its most public space is on its roof rather than down on the ground where people can access it. On the ground, it's actually quite massive and kind of impenetrable. And let's, be, let's face it, it's controversial because it, it looks weird. Um, it is the height of postmodernism. Um, my mom is sitting in the audience right there. And there's a kind of joke where, it, when she asks about uh, what a word means, I say, hi, mom, postmodernism is a time in the 1980s when uh, people are looking at the use of history and narrative. Um, so this is a kind of height of a kind of what a postmodernist building would uh, look like. Mom. Mom. <laughs> And so we wanted to revisit this uh, building um, because, both, for one reason, because it's an important building. Uh, it's an important building in the city. And we're also really interested in the themes that it brings up. Uh, so we borrowed this format that, that is called the late entry format, which was pioneered by an artist named Klaus Oldenburg, who proposed a late entry to the Chicago Tribune Tower competition with a giant uh, clothespin. Uh, and also, it was, this format was re refined by Stanley Tigerman, who is a kind of um, crotchety but awesome old man in Chicago who uh, kind of has a deep, deep architectural legacy uh, in the city. And in 1980, he held an exhibition and published a book called Late Entries to the Chicago Tribune Tower Competition. 
So there's this kind of uh, history of this late entry as a way of looking at Chicago competitions to rethink uh, the city in various ways. And in 1987, there was an episode of a PBS series called Nova, uh, where Stanley is quoted by, as saying, by selecting that scheme, the winning design for the Chicago Public Library, it sh sends Chicago backwards, away from its own future, precisely the way that the Tribune Tower competition did and the Columbian Exposition did. Because it is a building that's a study and distillation that feigns to be something of a time that is not ours, that uses as a role model the Bibliothèque saint Genevieve in Paris by Henri Le Brust. That's the problem with the kind of thinking that uses context to establish authority and uses verification of an earlier time to get over the insecurities of the natives of a city trying to seek authenticity. So to sum up, he didn't like it. <laughs> uh, he thought that it was silly that a, a, the, the city would need to look, make it build a new building that looks old to um, be able to uh, create a kind of civic building that we all feel comfortable with. So when we revisited the competition, we actually spent a lot of time in that library um, researching all the archives of the competition. And we came across this volume of public comments. Um, there were, I don't know how many there were, but the, vo the volume was like this thick. And the models- it's like a thousand something. Yeah, yeah, the models were on display for, um, I think a couple of weeks and there were comment cards and people would kind of write down what they thought. They thought, it, they, thought they had a vote, they didn't. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we visited the archives and we read through all of them. Um, some were insightful, some were funny, some were prophets, like one was saying, no spaceship Star Wars was their only comment. Which is, um, <laughs> which is unique because the George Lucas Museum is going up in Chicago and everyone is up in arms because they're, they're calling it the Star Wars Museum. Uh, and that's happening now. Um, so, but that conversation was also happening uh, in the late 80s when Chicago was declaring that they didn't want um, no, Star Wars. Ships. Starships yeah. and Star Wars. Um, so we produced 24 reactions to this project. We originally intended to do one and then said, well, why do one when you could do 24? And make it hard on yourself. So we did that. Um, so, but they each have their own narrative to them. Um, many take a bad situation and turn it into something positive. Um, some might be satire, um, while others are whimsical and joyful. Um, so for instance, one of them is called Escalating the Library. Um, where in the competition brief, the, there was a paragraph for, of requirements, and I think it said the word escalator 10 times. It said there should be escalators moving from floor to floor, and escalator, and escalator, and escalator. And there are a lot of escalators in that building. So we said, okay, let's just make a whole building out of escalators. Um, we, one of them was we took the kind of Sullivan tr transportation arch from the Columbian Exposition. Um, the Harold Washington Library steals from the Art Institute, which was part of the Columbian Exposition. So we decided to kind of still look to that as a um, device, but instead of um, picking one that was already kind of backwards looking, we pick one that's maybe more forward looking. Also, the Navy Pier Ferris wheel uh, is about to be taken down, uh, so we thought we could reappropriate it uh, for a library. Um, so some of them, for us, are inside jokes, um, and others take on concepts present in the existing library and bring them to a logical conclusion. Um, so, for instance, the Titanic um, was our homage to Stanley Tigerman um, with his uh, famous Titanic collage, so we sunk the library. Um, another one is the ruins. So if you want to make a building look old, why not make it look really old? Um, Another yeah, is uh, the Prentice Hospital. We thought maybe its ghost could come back and become uh, a library. Or another one where um, there's a series of buttons that are adorn the top of the uh, existing library. So if we want to use buttons and make it look out of fabric, let's just make it look all tufted. Um, so a lot of these kind of, oh, another one was just to kind of remake the cultural center uh, and bring it to the site uh, with the original library. So our, this is our installation at the Chicago Cultural Center. Um, it consists of a drawing and two models. Um, the main model is a collage of the 24 entries in a pile of narrative-driven forms. Um, 
a new building as a city, and they all have kind of conflicting stories. Um, each entry is at a 1 to 500 scale, which is also the scale of the site model on the left. So any one of these could kind of easily fit into the site model um, and produce a play on scale. So in the object, uh, or in the, the, the model of the building, uh, all the different stories are allowed to kind of collide uh, into new forms and arrangements. Uh, the one that's kind of featured here is just to take the Trump sign from the Trump building, turn it into the library so we could sell the naming rights um, and make some extra money. Here we see the, the Prentice Hospital um, on top of an aircraft carrier. Um, the aircraft carrier was a kind of homage uh, to a Hans Holein image. Um, and here's the bottom of some owls. So the owls uh, adorn the top of the, the, uh, the roof, those giant green sculptures are owls. Uh, we thought that why have them so far away when we could just make the whole building out of uh, the owls? Good idea. <laughs> Thanks. And so the, the whole thing is kind of layered with content, and, and it can be appreciated um, at, at almost any angle. And so we think that this is the best way to appreciate the project and maybe our work um, by uh, maybe looking at it quickly to try to understand it, but then maybe diving a little bit deeper, uh, making discoveries uh, as you do so, constructing your, or, uh, your own narratives about the project as you read the ones that are associated with it, and hopefully that you're laughing while you're thinking. Uh, so thank you very much. We are free to take some questions, um, if anybody has any. We would love to. model of it or the building that's proposed? The building itself, building itself uh, we don't know, although ironically, so we, like, we talk about these early buildings as projects we don't necessarily want to exist, but that we want to design in order to tell a story. Um, we, we were approached by a developer in China that wanted to build Farmland World, <laughs> and, we, and we felt really conflicted about that um, because we didn't know what material it would be made of, and we, don't, we didn't know what it would be appropriate for it. Um, but, uh, so, I mean, we were proposing that it would be made out of things that look like different farmhouses. Uh, so it would look like a kind of traditional farmhouse scattered into this kind of, um, turnip. Um, I don't, we hadn't figured it out as far as to be able to decide what, because we didn't actually build it, like, the guy just stopped returning our calls after we gave him a price. <laughs> no. I don't know if I'd want it to. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so, throughout your lecture and with the um, some of the projects, you showed how you treat the projects like in a playful way and you were it was like a good lecture and playful at the same time you know you. Uh, with good information but playful again um, so I wanted to ask you how does that help you in your everyday like conduct your work with your projects in an everyday basis that's a good question I mean I think uh, we, a student Gantos who was in our studio from two years ago uh, teaching here. We could, we, two years ago, we didn't have uh, the two built projects that we showed today. Uh, and we were kind of figuring out what the future of our practice would be. Like, would we continue to do these stories uh, in books, or would we start to build things? And we decided that we wanted to start to build things. And we, mm -hmm. so we've, we've been working really hard to try to figure out how to take the sensibility that we've been cultivated and, and shift it a little bit. and. Um, we had, a, we had a, some difficult time, you know, finding people, like, 
preaching to people or talking to people and people that just weren't so interested in it uh, because it's not, you know, it's, it's you got to find the right people. Um, mm -hmm. Over the course of the last year, we've been approached by people who want it. Um, and it, it tends to be a kind of public project um, or projects that are uh, maybe temporary um, that can activate people in, in unexpected ways. And so we haven't really had to pitch so hard for the kind of playfulness of the projects because of the type of projects that we've been doing. I think we'll probably have, an, as we try to grow, or as we try to take the next steps, we'll probably have to figure out another way of kind of presenting mm -hmm. the, the value of it beyond just kind of playfulness. But as of now, we found a little bit of a niche, but we didn't know we would get there because we didn't know what kind of projects that would be, it would be good for. Um, so we, we don't know <laughs> because uh, we either get said no or we say yes, yeah, somebody says yes, and then they're either way into it or they don't care at all, so. you want me to have the mic? Oh, okay, all right. Uh, just, just watching the lecture, and I knew a little bit about you guys because I was in that critical practice too, uh, two years ago. But y you guys are doing projects that a lot of us like wish that we could do. Like we wish that we could have this much fun and do stuff like that. But, but the reality. <laughs> But, but the reality of it is, is that I, I, I need to pay the bill somehow. Yeah. And so I have, to, I have to work, you know, a day job in order to do this kind of stuff mm -hmm. a lot of times. So, and now I see what you guys, you know, might be on a path to like something great. But in the very beginning, how did like finances really affect the way that you approached all this stuff? And was it a struggle for you? Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, it's always a struggle. I don't know that that'll ever go away. Um, you know, when we first started working together, um, we, Stuart was a full-time teacher, I had a full-time job, um, and we started, that, that I was being a teacher is not a job? No, no. you were a full-time teacher. Yeah. I worked but in an a office. Job. I worked in an office that I wasn't getting a lot out of um, creatively. So I, you know, the two of us decided that we would spend our evenings maybe doing some competitions or things like that um, in order to kind of keep that part exciting. And I think that we were successful with a, you know, a couple right off the bat. Um, you know, like Farmland World is, I think, the second competition we did, um, and we're still showing it. Um, so, I mean, I think that you just have to like go out there and do work for yourself, whether it's going to be seen or not, or anybody's paying you to do it, um, while you're um, being tortured elsewhere, I don't know. <laughs> no, but I think too, like I, we, I mean, teaching is really good for that, like, because teaching uh, requires you to do your own thing on, on this, like, separate from teaching, and so you get to figure out what that is. Uh, I got into teaching because I wanted to teach, but then second, like, found myself in a position of not knowing really what I was about or what I wanted to do, and so uh, we, we kind of, we, we just started by saying, well, what do we want to do? Uh, and let's do it. Like, let's have, like, we want to have fun, let's have fun. And uh, hopefully, you know, people will be, mm -hmm. uh, hopefully that will, success will come from that in some way. Um, but teaching has, uh, you know, allowed us to pay bills and do this stuff. But I think, I think the lesson of, of doing something that you care about and enjoy, people will kind of gravitate towards that. Um, and you'll not think of it as work because you enjoy it. And hopefully that can translate into things that make money. Um, we've, ha we've had a long lead time, I think, because we've been doing it for four or five years. So it's, figured, it's been a long time to figure out how it can be a money-making thing. Um, and we're slowly getting there. We have, it, we have our own office in the city. And like, so I think that you know, it's getting there, but um, it's, it was, it's slow. Um, you just have to persist, I think. Um, I think also, I mean, the things that we're doing now, I don't think we, we wouldn't be able to do them if we didn't work in offices um, when we were younger and kind of learn how to put a drawing set together. And like, I think all that stuff is really important for architecture, um, like learning the technical, maybe not so fun things. And getting really great at that stuff can allow you to kind of use those things and have fun with it. Yeah, I mean, there's a kind of investment that it's like, you, you, try, you figure these things out and then over time kind of leverage them into doing what you want to do with it. Anybody else? 
<laughs> um, so you said earlier that you keep showing the, the farm project. Um, you, know, you did it a really long time ago and that you've been About working long. for five years. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and then Philip said earlier that you have won so many awards just this year. So you've obviously been producing a lot. How do you choose those projects to show? Like, how do you rate their success? What's a successful project to you? That's a really good question. Yeah. That, that's a really good question because I think you know, our, our work is very subjective. Like we don't try to justify it based on quantifiable uh, uh, data or metrics, right? Um, and so how you choose what's good is tough because there is no way to uh, quantify that, really. Um, I think for us, Farmland World resonates well because people can read their own narratives into it almost completely. We wrote a narrative, but it can also just stand alone as an object and people can think about it in various ways. Um, it, you know, it was picked, it was uh, shown on, in websites that like thought it was about arguing for we should eat, you know, we should eat more sustainably or something like that. And that's not how we would talk about the project, but we're, <laughs> we're really glad that people would think that about it. Um, so I think that that fact that um, it was produced through a, a narrative that we thought was useful, but at the same time, it lives on in other people's imaginations in other ways. And so I think that that, that defines the success for our projects. Um, which ones are more successful or less? Um. Yeah. Right. Anybody else? Going once. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you, thank everybody. You guys. Appreciate it.